Hey, welcome back. Today we're going to look at uh, consumer spending and investment spending in a little bit more detail as we begin to continue to build our macroeconomic model. And uh, what we're going to look at today first is to be able to explain the concept of the multiplier and be able to calculate the size of the multiplier for both consumer and investment spending. And we'll talk about reasons why uh, consumer spending may change as well as reasons why investment spending uh, might change. And all this information is in your book and you can see the chapter and page numbers on the screen. You know, as a quick reminder, when we say what is GDP or we talk about GDP, we're talking about this simple uh, formula that you need to make sure that you commit to memory. And that is that GDP is equal to C plus G plus I plus X minus M. Or put a different way, consumption plus government spending plus investment spending plus net exports is what makes up GDP. And today we're going to look at C and I. First, when it comes to consumer spending or consumer consumption, um, people have what's known as a disposable income, which means the money that they've earned after taxes is available to them to do what they want with it. And there are really two things that you can do with your money, at least in this model. We're going to assume that you can either spend it or you can save it. And with every dollar you earn, we talked earlier about marginal benefit and marginal cost. We can talk about anything marginal as how much more given one more unit. So in the case of um, spending, we could say how much more spending do you do for an additional dollar that you receive? And that's what we call the marginal propensity to consume. And it's defined as the change in spending over the change in disposable income. So how much of every new dollar do you spend? Then the opposite uh, of spending is saving and so we call that the marginal propensity to save and that's the change in um, in saving given a change in income so how much of every dollar that you earn do you put towards savings so it shouldn't be a surprise to you then that the marginal propensity to consume which we will abbreviate as MPC um, added to the marginal propensity to save which is MPS should equal one, right? So for every dollar we earn, a portion of it goes to spending and a portion of it goes to savings. And we can also see with this uh, formula, the MPC plus MPS equals one, that we can uh, redefine the marginal propensity to save as being equal to one minus MPC. Just simple algebra. Subtracting MPC from both sides tells us that marginal propensity to save is equal to um, one minus MPC. And that's going to become important here um, in a little bit. We can get a sense for what I mean by marginal propensity to consume and marginal propensity to save by looking at what's called a consumption schedule. And this con consumption schedule in this table tells us um, as my disposable income increases by $1,000, how much will my consumption change by $1,000 and how much will my savings change for every time I add $1,000. And so we can see when we go from $13,000 worth of disposable income to $14,000, um, I increased my consumption by $800. So when we're talking about marginal propensity to consume, how much more consumption do I uh, engage in with an increase in income, I see that uh, my MPC should be uh, change in consumption, $800, divided by the change in disposable income, which is $1,000. And that tells me my MPC at this case is 0.8. And then if I go from fourteen dollars to $15,000, my consumption increases by $700 because I went from $13,800 to $14,500. So consumption increased by $700 when I increased income by a thousand, so my MPC would be 0.7. And we could continue to work through MPC from moving from 15,000 to 16,000 and from $16,000 in disposable income to 17,000, I'd see my MPC drops to 0.5. Sometimes your MPC changes as income increases and sometimes it stays the same, but you should be able to calculate it by looking at the, the numbers in a consumption schedule. On the flip side, we look at MPS and we say, okay, if MPC is 0.8, then my marginal propensity to save has to be 0.2. If I spent 80 cents for every new dollar I earned, I have to save the remainder, which is 20 cents. And, uh, and so, again, we go back to MPS is really 1 minus MPC. And we see that MPS um, continues to increase in this example. And as long as our MPC is greater than zero, we're going to see that consumer spending will actually increase the size of GDP. And it's going to increase it by more than just the initial spending that's being done. And it does that because of what's called the multiplier. 
With the multiplier, we got to keep in mind that one person's spending becomes another person's income. And that means that that becomes another person's spending. And it cascades through the economy, multiplying and gaining steam. It's like a snowball at the top of a hill rolling down, and it picks up um, more snow as it rolls. And it's the same thing with consumer spending. When I spend, um, my spending becomes somebody else's income, and they spend it on somebody else's goods, and that person uses some of the income to spend on somebody else's goods, and it begins to gain steam. So how do I calculate the multiplier? Well, I told you consumption grows when MPC is greater than zero, and the multiplier is rather simple. It's 1 over 1 minus MPC. So 1 over our marginal propensity to save becomes the multiplier. So any spending done will increase by as much as that multiplier. So let me show you on um, this pretty simple example what do we mean by the multiplier. Let's pretend that everyone in our simple economy has a marginal propensity to consume of 0.8. Um, and let's say Andrew spends $1,000 at Lily's shop. Well, if he spends $1,000, Lily gets 1000 Lily's propensity to consume is 0.8, so she'll spend 80% of that 1000 which means she gets, puts $800 uh, towards a purchase at Marsha's store. Marsha gets all 800 of those dollars and will consume 80% of that $800, so she'll put $640 towards a purchase at Pat's store. And Pat will do the same. He'll spend 80% of the $640 he received, and he'll spend money at Sundriana's store. And Sundriana will take 80% of her money that she received from Pat, and she'll spend it at Dan's store, and it'll keep cascading from there. So we see that with the initial $1,000 that Andrew put into the economy, there's already been $2,361.90 worth of additional spending. And in fact, we would see at the end of the day that the multiplier, if it was, if marginal propensity to consume is 0.8, and the multiplier is 1 over uh, 1 minus MPC, so it would be 1 over 0.2, which is 5. So the multiplier is 5. So we can say that at the end of the day, Andrew's $1,000 in spending will create $5,000 in total consumption throughout the economy. There are some factors that will change the amount of consumption that people um, will we'll engage in within the economy. Um, one of them is a change in future disposable income. If you expect a raise in the future, then generally speaking, what we find is that your spending will increase. You'll increase um, your marginal propensity to consume with an expected increase in uh, disposable income. The opposite is true if you expect to earn less. I mean, if you were told by your, your boss you're going to get a 5% increase in pay next month, you might choose to go out and start spending money now as if you had a 5% increase because you're expecting it to come in. Um, same thing with changes in aggregate wealth. If um, your stock portfolio is worth more now than it was before, then generally speaking what we would see is that people would engage in an increase in consumption. When you feel wealthier, you tend to spend more. Investment spending is just like consumption spending. The multiplier for investment is exactly the same as it is for consumption. It's 1 over 1 minus MPC. And all of the math for calculating an increase to GDP as a result of investment spending is exactly the same as it is for consumption. What we want to look at briefly here is what are some of the factors that impact businesses' decisions to in, in, engage in investment spending. And there are some factors that affect it. Um, one is the interest rate or the expected interest rate on loans. Another is their expected real GDP. And the third is the uh, current production capacity that a firm has. And we're going to deal with each one of these three in turn. In many cases, the uh, investment that's being done by businesses into capital and machinery and things like that is usually done through debt. And so debt uh, requires firms to look at what the interest rate is, what they're going to have to pay back when they borrow, because that's going to drive their decision as to whether to take on a loan or not. Because the firm has to balance two things. It has to balance the benefits of the investment, which is the additional sales it can create, with the costs of the project itself in, in terms of the interest rate that they have to pay. So let's take an example. Should I build my factory or not? Should I build a new factory or not? If I expect to get a 5% return on my investment, meaning the money I put in will generate a 5% profit to me as a company, but I have to pay a 7% interest rate on the money I borrow, should I build that factory or not? And the, the answer is no, you shouldn't, because essentially what you're doing is losing 2% uh, on your money. You're not gaining back as much as you have to pay back in interest, and so that's a net loss to you. And a firm wouldn't wouldn't pay, uh, wouldn't borrow to build that factory. It doesn't it doesn't pay for them. 
But if the interest rate were to drop to 3%, then the business would be looking at a 2% increase over its um, previous bottom line. And so that would then make more sense for them. If they can get a 5% return but only have to pay 3% for it, that's a good deal. One way of looking at it is saying, um, I gain a five cent profit at a three cent cost. So if it costs me three cents to make five, it's a good deal. And so the interest rate will drive the decision of whether or not to uh, engage in investment spending when compared to the expected return. Expected changes in GDP are also uh, a factor. If I think GDP is going to rise, then as a business, I would expect that means that I need more output because that would indicate that there's, um, there's more demand for my goods. And so then I would probably want to increase my investment spending to help me make sure that I can keep up with the demand for output in order to meet the needs of consumers. And so I will I'll, we'll increase my investment spending. The faster GDP rises, the faster I'm going to increase my investment spending. Production capacity is the last thing. Production capacity looks at how much stuff can I make with the current um, tools and resources available to me. And so it's basically my possible output. If I um, can create I'm creating less output than the maximum possible output available to me. That means I have what's known as excess capacity. I could be making more stuff, but I'm not for whatever reason. If I have excess capacity, then I don't need to increase my investment spending. So if I can be making lots of lots more stuff, but I'm just not because you know I've got lots of people that I'm I could be hiring, but I'm not. I could be running my machines 24 hours a day, but I'm not for whatever reason. Then there's no need for investment spending. I have the resources available to me to increase output if it's needed. So there'll be less investment spending. And if I am closer to my possible output, then that increases the need for investment spending. So as an example, if I have 100,000 unit capacity at my plant and there's only 50,000 units being demanded, then I don't need investment spending because I have 50,000 units of capacity left over. I don't need more machines if my demand for my product goes up. But if the demand was 125,000 for my products, then now I've gone beyond capacity. I can't produce that much. So I'm going to need to increase my investment spending in order to make sure that I push my production capacity beyond what's currently being demanded. We'll talk some more about, um, about all of this in class. We've got some problem sets to work through, and I look forward to seeing you then. Bye.